This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. Gonzaga, up one, Virginia ball, Mason to the rim, upstairs, knocked away, it's over. Forget about Cinderella. Gonzaga once again has proven they are legit. Going back to March 16th. 2001 first round of the NCAA tournament it was Virginia as a five seed Gonzaga as a 12 seed Mark Fuse second season at Gonzaga and we're gonna go back because it was a a really good game uh one point victory we're gonna go all the way through it but I want to talk a lot about where Gonzaga was at the time because now they enter the 2021 tournament as the favorite to win the national championship they've come a long way over the last 20 years Mike we're recording this on the 20th anniversary of this game what do you think about that the twentieth anniversary of Gonzaga, Virginia, two thousand one. I mean, this is gonna, this is this is a landmark moment for the podcast. A day, yeah, this day in sports, Gonzaga, Virginia, in Memphis for the first round. But listen, we were going back trying to find games. We're trying to line up our schedule a little bit with the tournament, which kicks off this week. And I went back and was like, hey, let's find something around early two thousands. We hadn't been in that that range a ton, and let's try to find a game that was good and I was looking through the bracket and I saw this was a one point game and uh Gonzaga was a 12 seed kind of back as they were starting to become that they were they were shedding the Cinderella slipper as Ian Eagle said in this game but they were kind of on the rise so going back to see where they were now or then compared to where they are now I thought was pretty interesting so you know it, it, it's not one of the games that you automatically think of in the tournament Mike but it's one of those classic really well played games back and forth and a 12 beats a five we see it every year yeah, there's a lot of these kinds of games throughout NCAA tournament history. I thought this one was good to pick because Gonzaga is the number one overall seed this year, like you mentioned, and Virginia is our most recent champion. So um, True. Good, good parallels in that respect, too. So let's go also, before we get started, too, go ahead and make it clear that you you don't want to say Gonzaga right at all today, right? I, I just know I'm going to slip up. So Gonzaga, Gonzaga. But that was a big part of Gonzaga bursting on the scene, right, was Dan Munson when this all got started schooling everyone in a press conference on the proper way to say Gonzaga instead of Gonzaga, right? That was a big, remember that? Yeah. 20 plus years even, later, you're still, you're still not saying it correct. I'm still, I'm still refusing. I'm very defiant. <laughs> so we'll go through that today. You can find this game. We're going to put it up on our website, distant replay So you can go back and watch it as it aired on CBS 20 years ago. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube as well. Please subscribe to the podcast and the YouTube channel. That helps us out a lot and helps uh, the channel continue to grow. About to cross 2,000 subscribers, which we're excited about. So let's go into this game, Mike. Uh, Gonzaga, at this point, as I mentioned, this was year number two under Mark Few. And, you know, you're talking about a program that came in here. They, in the 90s, kind of started making the turnaround. And then you, you mentioned Dan Munson, who... Got him to the Elite Eight and then bolted for Minnesota. In steps Mark Few and just picks up the torch and runs with it. Yeah, so there there was genuine concerns, obviously, when you have a Dan Munson who elevates Gonzaga to the point where they're in the Elite Eight, right? right. And now you switch to this new guy, Mark Few, who was an assistant in Spokane for a decade. How would they make the transition? This happens a lot with these programs that sort of burst on the scene. When you get the new coach in there, What's going to happen next? And we know with the be benefit of hindsight what's happened since then. But there were questions, and this is one of those tournament runs where the Zags are not like a, don't have a lights out good record coming into this game, right? They they lost four or five games at one point during the regular season. So to me, this game and this run solidified them just as much as the two runs previous to this. Because now maybe we're not getting a vintage, really good Gonzaga team, and they're still able to compete with big programs. Yeah, it kind of felt like this team was kind of an in-between where you came off a couple of really good players and a really good team prior, and then there were some good young kids on this team. There, no, there was a couple of good upperclassmen too, but you know, Blake Stepp was a guy that would kind of carry this program for a couple of years beyond this game. So it kind of felt like you said – is Gonzaga going to just kind of fall off? They're, yeah, they're going to win the West Coast Conference. 
just about every single year. They'll dominate out there. But can Mark Few, who's been an assistant and and since day one has coached in the Gonzaga program, has never been anywhere else, is he a guy that we're giving to because he's he's kind of earned it? putting in his time at Gonzaga or is he the best coach that's available right now and I think there were questions at this point and this this tournament I think answered as you as, as you said answered a lot of those questions because they weren't able just to win one game they went a, won a couple of games and again found themselves in the sweet 16 which now all of a sudden is be, kind of becoming a normal spot for them and what was a remarkable story a couple of years prior and like the late 90s early 2000s like this was like oh there's so much fun to pull for Gonzaga right but now, like they're like a legitimate program, they're starting to kind of plant those roots for what would be to come. Yeah, and the only thing you knew about the Zags before 1999 was that John Stockton went to school there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So you look at the back of his, you look at the back of his basketball card or or whatever, and say, Gonzaga, what what is that? Where is that? You know, yeah. it looks funny on the back of a basketball card. That's about all you knew about this program before 1999. Yeah, that's a good point. And this team got off to a six and five start. I think you kind of touched on it a little bit. But this Gonzaga team, you know, out of the gates this year, they lost over four out of five during one point in December, and you know, to a couple of good teams. But they they lost to a couple that were, you know, probably questionable that year, as like Green Bay, New Mexico, a couple of the games they lost that year. They went on a huge run and then ran through the the West Co- West Coast Conference tournament as they always do, seemingly, and found themselves playing this Virginia team and this Virginia team was led by uh, Pete Gillen. I, what, how do you feel about Pete? What, what are your thoughts on him as head coach? You know, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting that, that we did this game because Pete Gillen in a lot of ways, when he was at Xavier was in like a Mark few kind of role where he was leading like a, a very good mid-major program. Um, and one that he had sustained success with. I mean, he was at, at Xavier for just about a decade. Then he went to Providence, sort of in that, you know, underdog role at programs that may be a little, the very well-respected, established programs, but a little, you know, under the radar. Then when he went to Virginia, I think he just had a situation where he got swallowed up, him and his teams, in like a, a, a conference that was really, really good at the time. And I think that happens a lot when coaches go to major conferences but are not at one of the major blue bloods. It's easy for them to get in that perpetual, we're going to finish between fourth and eighth in the conference, which is really not that big of a difference win or loss wise. And so I think overall, he's a very good coach. It's just tough to compete with those upper echelon schools at those power five conferences if you're not at one of those schools. And you look at the schedule they played that year, and the, you know Wake was a top five team when they played them. Duke, North Carolina, all top five teams. Maryland was a top ten team. Wake Forest was ranked this year. I mean that that that's a brutal schedule to go through. But this Virginia team, who was coming off an NIT appearance the year prior, this Virginia team, I think probably had some expectations. But they went into this year. They they early on this season beat Tennessee. In the Jimmy V Classic, who was Tennessee at this time was number four, Mike. So a huge win, a top five win early in the season. But then they got off to an awful start in ACC play, losing to Wake Forest, Georgia Tech, Duke. They lost to Duke by 42, okay? But at the end of the year, this Virginia team beat Duke again, the team they lost to, again, by 42 points, beat them in Charlottesville, then beat number two North Carolina a week later in Charlottesville by 20. So they were rolling at the end of the year. I mean, you have you have wins over those two teams. The end of the year, you're on a you're finishing on a pretty high note. But they kind of limped into the tournament, losing at Maryland to finish a regular season. Then they lost to Georgia Tech in the their quarterfinals of the ACC tournament. So this is such a mixed bag, and it kind of speaks to you know what Gillen did a lot of the career. Some really high high points, but then just some I hate to say mediocrity, but in many cases, it's kind of what it was like a pretty good team, but just not that next level. Yeah, and what you described, for a team to go 9-7 and seven in the ACC and still get a 5 seed speaks to how good the conference was back then. I'll go through what you just said, Ben. Once you beat Duke in North Carolina in this era, like you're in the tournament. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And then when you couple that with like the loss to Maryland, you got to remember back then Maryland is – we're in the Lonnie Baxter, Juan Dixon era back then, aren't we? Yep. This Maryland yeah. team would actually go on to, to make the Final Four. So Okay, yeah. yeah. So we're talking about, again, a serious Maryland team. You know what I mean? So – um, which just goes to show barely above 500 in that league gets you a five seed, which you don't see that much. No. And so you can kind of tell how good they were. It's kind of weird that year. The ACC tournament was played in the Georgia Dome. I don't really remember that ever being played in the Georgia Dome, but 
that is the case this year. Some players on this team. Who 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 did you remember about this squad? Because I'm sure I'm sure you're not you're not honed in on the 2000 2001 Virginia Cavaliers men's basketball team. But who who did you remember off this roster? So I remember Roger Mason. Yeah, I think he was a pretty well known name. I remember Donald Hand, um, right. just because he was a good college player. And I'll tell you what, there was a couple other players on their team that you're surprised weren't better. You know, when we go back and do these games and. You get the guy who looks like he has the athleticism, the length, mm-hmm. the skill set. Why isn't that guy? Why wasn't that guy better? To me, that in this game, that was Chris Williams. Yeah, he just looked like a presence, and I, I honestly didn't remember him. But, um, but those would be the guys I remember. Uh, the backcourt for Virginia. You know about Chris Williams, man. He, um, you didn't know this, but it's funny that you brought him up. He actually is from Birmingham and played high school in Birmingham during this like late nineties. So he played the same time I was in high school, in a different high school in Birmingham. So like our school played these guys and he played, he had a couple guys on his team. One of them's been an assistant for Mike, uh, Mike Anderson for a long time, but he, uh, like this team was electric dude, like guys that could jump out of the gym. He was just one of like three or four guys that were really good on this team. So I remember this, this squad really well, because obviously it's a big story. He went to Virginia, you know, anybody out of Birmingham going to an ACC school to play basketball, it's going to be a big deal. Anytime you're out of the region and go to the ACC to play basketball, it's a big deal. But kind of remember that I'd forgotten about him being on that team. But when I, when you said that, and when I saw this roster again, it brought it back. But unfortunately, sadly, he passed away four years ago just 36 years old, had blood clots in his heart. So very, very sad finish, but definitely a guy that was super talented. And you could see it like in high school into his college career, very good. He played like overseas for a long time. So he had the talent, just it just never tra- translated to that NBA level. Yeah, you could just see on the court. I mean, he stuck out amongst, you know, when you stick out amongst all other Division One players, you know, it says something. Look, it's, it's um, it, we did not plan this little segment we just went on, by the way. Just so the viewers know, I had no clue about that connection, Ben. Yeah, pretty crazy, right? He was ACC Rookie of the Year in 99, too. So, you know, he had the accolades. A couple of all-ACC teams, second and third team. So, really good player. But uh, he was a big part of this this roster here. But, yeah, the only guy that went to the NBA off this team was Roger Mason. So, kind of surprising off that. And then you look at the other side, the roster for uh, Gonzaga. So, when I first saw these rosters, too, Mike, I'd kind of forgotten the names. Like, if you had told me who was on the 2000-2001 Gonzaga team, I probably wouldn't have named a single player. But then, like, you dive back into it, and then you, these all these guys start coming back to you, right? But who, who, was, the, who was the guy on this, this team that, uh, that you really remember the most? Gonzaga has two or three guys on all these teams during this area. Let's say from 99 <laughs> to 2009. Let's just mm-hmm. use that decade. Because I think since then, they've kind of gotten good recruits and kind of taken things to the next level. But like in 99, you had, you remember like Matt Santangelo and Richie Fromm, right? This team now, it's Dan Dickow, Casey Calvary, and Blake Stepp, right? Those are the guys you remember. Following this little generation, you had Adam Morrison, which I think the Adam Morrison era, him being co-national player of the year, I think that elevated Gonzaga even one step further Mm -hmm. to where big-time recruits or big-time junior college transfers or big-time overseas players had no problem going to Gonzaga. So I think this this program got elevated in stages, and this this group was the bridge between the Santangelo and Fromms who started all this and the Adam Morrison who took it to the next level. But Dick Al, Calvary, Step, those are the names you remember if you go back and watch this and you're a college basketball fan back then. I think the guy that maybe right before – uh, Adam Morrison, I think Blake Stepp was kind of that guy too, where he kind of legitimized the program in a way because he was out of Eugene, Oregon, right? So right in Oregon's backyard, he was the Oregon Gatorade Player of the Year. You know, a lot of these guys that they had brought in up to this point, Dick Al, Calvary, these guys are all Washington guys, right? You know, they're kind of there, um, almost in their backyard. So they're not they're not going out and pulling guys from other states. They're just finding really good guys around there and developing them. But Steph was kind of one of those guys that kind of came in the program as a top-notch recruit that was not from Washington. So he was kind of like that step before Adam Morrison, and he was a great shooter. And you probably remember a lot of, that he accomplished during his career. He's just a freshman in this game. Yeah, he's one of those guys that you know you kid around about him, like a Lawrence Moten or <laughs> one of those guys who seems like they're in college forever. That was Blake Step. Yeah, Dan Dickel. I I got to be honest, I had no clue that he had a long NBA career. Oh yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, no, I did. Yeah, yeah I knew that. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah and that's yeah. because I, I, as I think I've said on here, I don't follow the NBA as closely. Like I watch the playoffs and pay attention to it, but I'm not going to be able to name you the six man on a lot of teams. But the fact that Dick Howe had a long NBA career that uh, that surprised me a little bit, but but pretty cool. He had a better. I mean, he had a better NBA career than Adam Morrison did. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> Calvary did not, although he was very dominant at the the collegiate level, but. That's a Gonzaga yeah, six, team. Nine, a 6'9", bulky center who can't jump. I mean, yeah, that doesn't translate into the NBA unless you're uh, Charles Barkley. <laughs> well, Charles could jump, man. Golly. No, getting I know. On, I, know, I, know, I, know no. I, I the People think of – you're right. The, people think of Charles like Charles when he was 30, 35 years old. But if you right. catch Charles when he was 18 to 21, he was jumping through the gym. You're yeah, right. Prime. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the Gonzaga team. This tournament – so we'll, we'll set the stage for this NCAA tournament – which you had, again, this was the 5-12 matchup, which is a great one. And this is time, too, when, you know, you're not getting the constant scores, you know, in the corners or, in like, the top line, you know, the kind of the transparent watermark that's got the, the all the scores running throughout the game. Although they did have one, and I, I, I was surprised that they had a top-left score bug. And I was surprised that they actually had that in there, Mike, because I, I felt like that was a much – it didn't go back 20 years. I thought that was more of a recent development. So I was kind of surprised to see that in this game when it, when, it, when it aired. Yeah, very low tech as compared to those bugs now, but at least like we were able to see what the score and the uh, time left on the clock was, which is refreshing. Yeah, absolutely. Duke was a one seed, obviously, tournament champion in the ACC. Kentucky was a two in that region uh, with them. Then you had in the West, Stanford was the one seed. They were the regular season champs out there. Um, Iowa State was the two seed. So you look back on that one, kind of a surprising one-two from what you would think of now. The South had Michigan State and North Carolina as the one-two, and that's where Virginia and Gonzaga found the, uh, themselves as well. So uh, those are the three regions there in the Midwest. Illinois was the one seed with Bill Self, and Arizona with Lute Ols Olson was the two. Ole Miss was the three that year, by the way. Rod Barnes, remember the Rod Barnes era? Where are we Are we well beyond the Blake, uh, not a Bryce Drew shot here? Uh, not, well, not well beyond. That was probably like, Mississippi was good then too. Is my point? Yeah, yeah. They've had a few. Yeah. They've had a handful of pretty good years. Candace and Roy Williams was actually the four seed in this. So I feel like Roy's been around for so long at North Carolina, but you go back twenty years ago and uh, still at Kansas. So look, Ben, I think of him equally uh, as at Kansas as North Carolina. Do you? Yeah, oh yeah. That's just I, I don't know because when I was really following college basketball the whole time, like plugged in every day, he was at Kansas. Okay, fair enough. So let's get into the game itself, Mike, and we won't spend a ton of time on it. It was a, it was a good game, but there's not a there's not a huge buzzer beater or any huge dramatic moments that you, know, you get a lot of times from these. But you had Ian Eagle and Jim Spinarkle making the call in this game, which was in Memphis at the Pyramid, the old Pyramid. You know, Ben, you could take your Jim Nance, Billy Packer, or Jim Nance and whoever he's doing, Bill Raftery now, right? I love Bill Raftery, but give me an Ian Eagle, Jim Spinarkle, Early start from Memphis. That's NCAA tournament right there. You know, this 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 broadcast crew that comes together, it seems like every March, and you're like, oh, yeah, Ian Eagle and Jim Spinarkle. <laughs> These guys are awesome. You know, you forget because you don't see them together throughout the season. So I like that aspect of the NCAA tournament. Like there's continuity with guys that don't work together all the time, which is awesome. Right. Um, and Ian Eagle is a staple up here in the New York area. Great announcer. And Jim Spinarco, I think, is a very good analyst as well. Um, knows knows college basketball inside and out, and showed showed it in this game. And you mentioned the pyramid. The pyramid is a, a big part of this game to me because that's a classic college basketball venue. Um, yeah. When I when I think because Memphis or Me they're Memphis State back in the day. Right. They've ne they've always had an average to above average college basketball program. But put that to the side. Their fans are super into it. Memphis. University of Memphis or Memphis State has a very, very loyal fan base for basketball in particular. It's a basketball school. And the pyramid, I mean, when I think of the pyramid, I think of Anthony Hardaway back in the day, you know? Um, so it, it brings back memories. And that's just a classic college. Not very many venues do you think that venue, college basketball. But for this one, for the, the pyramid, that's exactly what I think of. Do you know what the pyramid is now? Are, are, no you, are you up to date I, on this? I know it's not a place where they play games anymore yeah because right? the fedex forum now is in in downtown memphis where the grizzlies play and memphis plays um the pyramid now is a bass pro shops 
Okay. It's like the largest Bass really? Pro Shops. <laughs> wow. And it reopened in 2015. They got a they got a hotel, restaurants, a bowling alley, archery range, outdoor observation deck, all this stuff. So your uh, your mecca for basketball is now a Bass Pro Shops. Yeah, I knew it wasn't an arena <laughs> anymore, but l- like normal, everything gets ruined. <laughs> you can still visit it though if you want to and, and relive the memory. They have a but, little plaque there. They have a little plaque there, like this was I'm center sure. court, like I'm in the middle sure. of the parking lot somewhere. <laughs> the 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 seven thousand spit spot parking lot hey a couple other announcer duos that i was looking at you know researching this game tim brando and rick patino were on a call together God, for rick for the patino. region in dayton so this is what rick was in between the celtics and i, I uh, guess what was going on i don't even know yeah and I don't then even know. <laughs> and then you had craig craig bowler jack and james worthy on a call as well so yeah. wow very yeah. interesting yeah this would this would have been the transition from the celtics to louisville it happened yeah. no one for Bettina. Yeah, so yeah. I don't remember him ever on a NCAA tournament call, but no, no, he was briefly. That was his one shiny moment. So there you go. Um, all right, into this game, Mike. So there, let's start first half. I, I thought this was a, a again a kind of a vintage Gonzaga team, right? That really runs a really good offense. And I know as you you've coached some in, in your days. What do you think about the Gonzaga offense? Because it's fun watching. I feel like they're always very efficient. We see it today, like. You don't. You, I don't think of Gonzaga as a up tempo, fast pace. You know, let's get the rebound and, and go necessarily. But it's always a team that that's putting up eighty to ninety points on a regular basis. Yeah, and in this era in particular, it always seemed like they were getting a good shot. Like it always seemed like the shots they were yeah. getting, the guys were wide open. Or if the guys were in isolation, they were in spots that worked for them to be in isolation. Just like a really efficient offense is the way I put it. And you see that with Gonzaga in this game. Very, very, like, what I mean, what I mean, like, they, they dish it out to a guy for an open shot. He's in rhythm taking the shot. Like a good fundamentally sound passing team, shooting team, and different guys who can score. They're not just based on, you know, they had a, they had a couple guys in this game who had better games than others. But, you know, you had different threats to score the ball, which always helps an offense, obviously. And just the pace of this game overall had a really good pace to it. Yeah, it was a fun game to watch because I know a lot of times you'll find a college basketball game that, you, know, you could find playing in the 50s pretty regularly, right? Especially now when we see Virginia play, 50s and 60s quite a bit. But this game didn't have that 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 scoring, uh, that limited scoring. This game was played at a much better uh, pace, as you said. Virginia in this game had five fouls before the me- first media timeout. That was crazy. I know I've seen foul trouble before, but the fact that they had, they were almost in the bonus by the first media timeout was 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 nuts. And you had and so the, that foul, foul trouble became a theme here throughout this game. First of all, yeah, which is surprising in a game that was so well played from an offensive perspective. Usually if there's too many fouls, it ruins the, the flow of the offense, but it did in this game. And now the foul trouble early though, gave us our first glimpse at Stefan Dondon, who came in as a <laughs> sub for Virginia, all time name, all time name. You love that one. Yeah, that's when you're watching like at home and you're like nowadays and you're like Stefan Dondon and you Google him like, did I hear that name right? It's like Bubakar out, right? Yeah. That's another yeah, classic one. Yeah, yeah, ja from last episode. <laughs> Tremendous. This game, though, like Gonzaga jumped out. Um, they were they were scoring kind of at ease. You see the three point shooting, Dick Al. I mean, it was a three headed monster, right? Dick Al, Step, and Calvary kind of paced this team from the beginning, and it just a well played uh, well played game. And they were able to jump on Virginia early. And I think what was a pretty interesting point in this because this is only Gonzaga's fourth NCAA appearance. But when you go back to this game, you know, I think Eagle or Spinarco points it out. This game, this Gonzaga team has more NCAA experience than Virginia does. And it's because of what they had done the previous few years. And this is Virginia's first trip back to the tournament in like six years or something like that. So you or four years rather. But you can kind of see the difference in these two teams and the experience is on Gonzaga's side, which is surprising now to think about. Yeah, very well put. This is the first time where you can see their experience sort of like, wow, Gonzaga has more experience than Virginia. You know, you step back, you take take notice of that. But give Virginia credit. You know, they're down most of the half, but they come back to tie it with five minutes and 30 seconds left. That's where you see Roger Mason, Chris Williams, Donald Hand start to assert themselves. And you could just tell the difference in athleticism during this stretch where it's like, all right, if these guys are plugged in and playing efficiently, they can make this a game because they're just overwhelmingly athletic. Another thing I noticed from this game, the three-point line was back where it touched the top of the key, top of the lane. But now, you know, they've moved it back. I don't know where what exactly the line is now. But, you know, it pretty much spans all the way to the corner. Like so much so that 
it's pretty common now for college basketball players that catch a pass in the corner to step out of bounds. It happens all the time, which is kind of maddening to watch. But this court looks it looks different when you're watching this game and that and that line's brought in so much. It seems like either the court's big or the lane's just really small compared to what we see now. Did you notice yeah, you're that? Right. Yeah, you do notice it from how basketball is now. You do. Now, I'm more, just from watching basketball over the years, I'm more used to this setup. I still get thrown off by this setup that you mentioned where the guys are in the corner and they go out of bounds. Yeah. Um, what you're right is like the most maddening thing ever. It's like, dude, you don't have to pay to go to college. Like, can you figure out how to stay in bounds or no? Well, a lot, a lot <laughs> of it too, the argument is like, let's, let's, the, the corner, let's move the line in like another three or four inches or whatever it is. Like, it, there literally is like if for guys with huge feet, probably you put your foot down. You're probably either standing on the, either on the sideline or the three point line, like one of the two. Like it's yeah. Let's close, let's, but... let's let's change the dimensions of the entire court because guys can't figure out how to follow the rules. <laughs> that seems that seems logical. Let's do that. Listen to you, salty today on this twentieth. No, I'm not salty. It's just you know it's like stay in bounds, bud. Come on, it's the same court. You're practicing on the same court. It's not a different court for you, and it's a different court for the team, you know, in your conference. So figure it out. Right. Dick Al had a really good first half, by the way. What do you have, 21 or something like that? Yeah, 21 in the first half. They're up by six heading to half. And he's having a like he's having a really good first half. He is, you know, the the Virginia guards came into this game as, you know, the most impressive part of their team, and he's taking them to school. He looks really good. And, and Gonzaga looks in control of this game. And and I look at it now, Mike, and I, you know, you watch this game. And after this first half, I'm sitting there thinking, like, how is Gonzaga a 12 seed? Like, they're not – I know there were some really good teams in the ACC, but the fact that, that this Virginia team – just on – like, you watch these two teams play, and you see some talent on Virginia, obviously, but this seems like a pretty evenly matched game. And it almost seems to me, you know, watching this first half, that Gonzaga is a better team. But it's surprising this was a 5-12 game. Yeah, because, you know, you get – some years, Ben, if you look at the NCAA tournament, there's not that much – if you look at the point spread, yeah, which I couldn't find a point spread for this game – but sometimes the point spreads are not that big from a you know a five, in a five twelve matchup because there's not that much different bet- difference between the teams depending on the year and how deep you know how deep the field is. Um, but yeah, you bring up a good point with that for sure. These teams did not look like they were seven spots away in terms of seeding. Yeah, that's a good point on the point spread. I don't know what it was either at this point, but yeah, it was probably I would imagine it was probably pretty close. Um, it's you know probably I would say five six maybe. Who knows what it would have been, but yeah, I think that's that's a fair argument to to point out. Um, so the second half, or you have anything else? First half, we go second half, Mike. No, I'm good. You're good. Okay. So second half again, Gonzaga really just kind of maintains control. I thought, you know, I was kind of surprised foul trouble became an issue in this game, but I was kind of surprised that Gonzaga really, but they would kind of extend their lead out pretty good ways, and then Virginia would kind of make it a game, but. Almost this entire way, Gonzaga just holds on to this lead and just kind of continues to do what they do, hit some outside shots, good mid-range, mid-range game, and then Calvary inside. Yeah, uh, Calvary got into some – there's a lot of mate, lot of players in this game ended up in foul trouble. The second half, what you see is like an emergence of Calvary and also the emergence of Roger Mason Jr. for Virginia. He's kind of the one who stabilized the game for them and got them back in it. And he actually, at the end of the day, ended up with more points than Blake Stepp did. He ended up with 30 points in this game. Yeah, had a heck of a game. So this game gets down to the end, and I thought, you know, this was a, a classic finish because you have these five twelve games, right? That a lot of times can go one of two ways in the spot. So the the, the underdogs lead the entire way, right? They are in control. It looks like the you know we got a, a guaranteed upset, and then finally, finally in the final minute of this game, minute and a half, Virginia finally takes an eighty five eighty four lead. I don't remember if this was their first lead. I don't think it was their first lead of the game. But they probably hadn't led for a combined like more than a couple minutes in this entire game. And they finally claw all the way back and take this one point lead with a minute, minute and a half left. And to me, that's that moment in the game where if you're the underdog, you're like, dang, man, we had this game all the way through. And then we finally let Virginia claw back. And that's kind of where the underdog typically folds. But it didn't happen here. No, it didn't. And you're thinking, you know, I started to think, you know, wow, Virginia's up late. It requires a, a, a hoop by Calvary with nine seconds left for, for Gonzaga to take the lead back and ultimately win this game, right? But if that doesn't happen, you know, I mean, this is one of those turning I, – I think this that's why this game is important. It's one of those turning points for this Gonzaga program where they're able to pull a game out like this where maybe this is not a vintage Gonzaga team, but they play really well. And, again, goes on, on another chapter in them shedding that Cinderella label. And the reason why I think that's important is 
that leads them to be able to get a higher level of recruit and sustain what they have going for longer. Yep, yeah, exactly. And I thought there was a, a, an important sequence in this final game that I, if I, at the end of this game that I, I thought definitely would have swung towards Virginia, but they get the ball back after getting a stop. So they got they took the lead and they get a stop from Gonzaga. Now they got the ball up a point in control. They miss the three, a bad shot, by the way. They should have probably done, they probably should have tried to get to the basket or at least work it a little bit more to get a more open shot. The shot they took was a three they probably could get at any point. But anyway, they got the offensive rebound then got fouled. So they were on the line, a one and one after missing this, getting the offensive rebound, and then they missed the front of the one and one. That was that was the stretch for me where you know, if you, you're that team, you got to score there and put that game away. They had the opportunity and they didn't. And then, of course, as you said, Calvary had the, the points. But I was also surprised watching this game. This final minute almost played out in real time. Like it, there was a couple of fouls, but you didn't have the stoppages and the constant timeouts. After that missed, that missed uh, free throw, Gonzaga came down, scored, and then Virginia came right back down the other way, missed the shot at the end. Um, not a great attempt, but I just enjoyed not having the interruption, just having the flow of the game and watch it finish. Yeah, you begin to, when you do what we do and go back and look at these games, you begin to appreciate games that have a good flow, and this one did. And I think it played a role in how high scoring the game was and how well it was played, and certainly with how this ending played out, like you mentioned. And, you know, there was foul trouble throughout, but I got to be honest, there was a lot of a lot of swallowing of the whistle late in this game. There was a lot of contact in the paint on many of these possessions late in this game, and the refs just let it play out. Yeah, they did. You know, they, uh, what, but you know, why well, don't think overall is a well officiated game? But right, you're right. They, they they swallowed the whistle when you know late in the game. So Gonzaga would hang on to win this game, eighty six eighty five to advance on. So let's look at what happened the rest of this tournament real quick, Mike, before we close things out here. So as I mentioned, they would go on to play in the Sweet 16, but Gonzaga played Indiana State in the second round. Indiana State was a 13 seed. It just beat Oklahoma in the first round. Maybe we should have watched that game too. It's a two-point win. And then Gonzaga ran up into, uh, up against Michigan State, who beat him by 15 in the Sweet 16. But another, another great performance by Gonzaga making the Sweet 16, not able to break through. But this Michigan State team would go on to beat Temple and then would move on to the uh, the Final Four and lose to Arizona. So the championship in this, as I mentioned, Maryland made the Final Four, by the way. I think I already said that. But Duke beat Maryland, Arizona beat Michigan State. Then you had that Duke-Arizona game, which was a classic. Oh, that Duke-Arizona game was a classic. And I was at University of Maryland. You're jogging my memory now. I was at the University of Maryland for the Maryland-Duke Final Four game. And if I'm not mistaken, that involved the Duke comeback, like a very pretty serious Duke comeback, I think. Uh, Maryland was winning most of that game. And to say there were a, was a mini riot after that <laughs> game at the University of Maryland campus would not be an overstatement. You know how college kids get when their team loses. I mean, oh, yeah. You know, so um, you're probably familiar with that from Alabama, but you just jogged my memory with that. So thank you. Well, uh, I, I just went quickly back to it. Maryland was up 49 38 at halftime of that game, but Duke outscored yeah. him by 22 in the second half. Yeah, there you go. So you could imagine Maryland's about to be Duke in the Final Four. You know, at that point, Maryland and Duke are are it's a pretty good rivalry they have going at that point. So yeah, so that's that. First of all, you jog my memory. Now Duke <laughs> Arizona, great. Look at listen to these rosters, okay? For Duke, you had their starting five was Shane Battier, Chris Duhan, Mike Dunleavy, Jay Williams, and Casey Sanders. Right, but off the bench. They had Carlos Boozer, who played 30 minutes, and Nate James. All right? Yeah, pretty that's good. Duke. That's Duke, 35-4 and four this season. Now, you tell me if I'm wrong. Jay Williams was is one of the top five college basketball players I've ever seen. Man, that, I mean, I've that's ever a seen list, now. but gotta, he's definitely up there. He was great. He, I think we forget now because maybe his pro career didn't meet expectations, and you know, I don't know if he's, he's an okay analyst, I guess, but – he was a great college player. Mm -hmm. That's fair. All right. Now, Arizona, Jason Gardner, Lauren Woods, Richard Jefferson, Gilbert Arenas, Michael Wright, Luke Walton. Mm -hmm. That's a team right there. Yeah. They, they, were, they, they, were, they were stacked too. And Richard Jefferson and Gilbert Arenas are the, you know, ended up being the two best pros from this game and, and Battier. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, no, sure. that was a good team. Those were those were both good teams and a great championship. Great Final Four, honestly. Had it. Uh, all four of those teams were really, really good that year. So, a uh, good tournament all around. Another another great 
Gonzaga run, but the beginning of what was being built by Mark Few along the way, and he's done incredible job getting them to the point now where they are the favorite going into the 2021 NCAA tournament. Outdated stuff, Mike, from this game. Um, the first thing that stood out to me was I love the TV promos, right? CBS always hammers home their TV lineup, their primetime lineup. But you had King of Queens, which was in its heyday in 2001. You had uh, Ed O'Neill was starring in The Big Apple, which I don't remember that show at all. And then Survivor was going on, too. You know, I was under the assumption Ed O'Neill went from Married with Children to uh, Modern Family, right? And I didn't know really what happened in between. And maybe that's because Big Apple was – and it, they made it sound like it was sort of popular, but I had, I had no recollection of it whatsoever. So I just pulled it up, right? So this, this, this game aired March 16th. The first episode was March 1st, 2001. Okay, so 15 days before. The final episode was April 19th, 2001. <laughs> okay, all right. So that's why I never heard of it. The spring, the spring of uh, 2001, <laughs> Big Apple was like a comet that came into our lives and left forever. We should do a Big Apple podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we should. We should do a terrible TV show. Oh, man. TV shows that didn't make it podcast. That's amazing. Uh, but um, And then Singular, which is a major... Their sponsor, major sponsor, back in this day, and they yeah. come up. They come up a lot during the games we do, and the biggest one to me, Ben. Do you have any recollection of what Ultimate TV was? Not really. It was like an, they build it as an interactive way to keep up with the scores. Did you notice mm. that throughout the game? Kind of. I wasn't paying that yeah. much attention to it. Yeah. No idea. You know, not, I had no recollection of that either. But those are some of the outdated things I picked up on. Huh. Yeah, this was like the era of like um, still still trying to figure out how to best use the internet, right? For for scores and stuff. So they'd have like some weird promos that um, just seem so foreign now with the way they would promote the internet. Hey, you know, get post game coverage on the internet, you know, like just all such a different time and place, but 20 years ago, man, so much has advanced since then. But overall, I mean, I would say Mike going back and watching this game, I, I still recommend every game we watch, you go back and watch. It's fun to go back and relive these games. They're good. But this game probably ranks toward the bottom of the list of the games we watched, mainly because it just didn't have, I, I, I went into it blind, like, hey, let's pick a game that was a one-point game in the tournament, an upset, you know, Gonzaga, plenty of storylines there. But the game itself was fine. It just wasn't very memorable. Yeah, it was, it was It was more memorable for what, you know, for what this meant to the Gonzaga run overall as a program than, like, this game being a classic, right? And I think we've hit on that a lot during this episode. But I agree with you. Like, they're sort of one of these type of games, at least in every tournament, you know, especially in the first and second round. So probably, when we go yeah. to the next week, we should probably tell her when we go to next week, we're going to do an Elite Eight game or a Sweet 16 game. And that the games we're kicking around to do, I guarantee you guys remember. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we remembered this one. This is one of those where you'd like catch like the final minute as they cut over from the game you're watching and actually saw how it finished up. But other than that, who knows? But it's been a great run for, for Mark Few since. Did you know, though, by the way, Pete Gillen, we touched on him a little bit earlier, but this was the last – the last uh, NCAA tournament game he'd ever coach. No, I didn't know that. Good yeah. career. Like I said, solid coaching career. Yeah, this this Virginia team, he was he coached them four more years, but they never made it back to the NCAA tournament, which is crazy, right? It's tough in the ACC, especially that time period, man. And, and Virginia kind of kind of wallowed around in mediocrity for, for much of the, the 90s, uh, at least late 90s and then 2000s until Tony Bennett finally came in in early, well, early 2010s. And then it's changed that program all all together. But this is kind of the middle of that. They only had a couple of they only had three like three tournament appearances in like fifteen years or so. So this is one of those for Virginia. One of the things you learn going back on these, Mike. What else, Mike? Anything else we need to get to? I don't think there's many what ifs from this um, this game itself. But anything else you want to add to the conversation? No, the only what if for me was what you know. What if Virginia holds on? Calvary doesn't put that hoop in with nine seconds left. You know, does that impact Gonzaga going forward, or do they just pick back right back up next year? Because the following year, you know, with Dan Dickow leading the charge, with uh, Roni Turioff, I remember Roni Turioff was coming bursting on the scene the next year, and they still had Blake Step. They had an even better season. So would it have even mattered if they lost? You know, I think you can deb debate that. Yeah, Gonzaga wouldn't actually get back to the Sweet 16 until 2006, and they only made one. Sweet 16 appearance over the next six years. They kind of got that rap as being a team that would lose in the first first weekend, right? They yeah. just beat oh, yeah. a bunch of, bunch of teams and lose in the first weekend. And then finally, I mean, up until 2000, honestly, 2015 is when they've really been consistently in that second weekend and beyond. 
Um, and now they are where they are. But it, it shows you what it takes to build a program, right? You got to continue to be there consistently. And then finally the breakthrough happens. I mean, it's it's rare yeah. you find a, a team or a coach that can get through there and be consistently in there every year, no matter where you are. That's why stick around like a guy like this, Mark Few, builds this program and now look where he is every year. Yeah, it's a numbers thing, right? If, you, if you're there enough, eventually the bracket will break your way or the close 50-50 balls in a certain game will break your way and you'll break through. But you have to be there, obviously, to have that happen. So, Absolutely. All right, that's going to do it for this episode of Distant Replay. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. Please hit subscribe on YouTube, on whatever podcasting platform that you listen on. We're going to have – we're doing trying to do three episodes a week. We got game. We got a documentary recap we're doing every week. We also have a true crime sport. So if you have any recommendations, any requests – for what we go and cover, send it to us. We'd love to hear from you. We'll put it on the list as well. So, Mike, got to get out of here on this episode, but enjoyed it. It's pronounced Gonzaga. Until next time.